Hi, it's The Wire. It is March 31st, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing. This is an overview video, kind of like a betting summary video of uh, some of the fights. There were a bunch of them that took place yesterday. We'll talk about it. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, on um, March 19th, I made a members-only video here online on the Tim Zhu sebastian Fundora fight. Now, Fundora delivered, right? The bet I proposed in that video was Fundora, simply to win at a plus 320, right? You, Jobs, hedged with Tim Zhu by stoppage, right? Now, just to understand, the money side of the play was clearly Fundora, simply to win at a plus 320. Zhu did not get the stoppage. The fight went the distance, and just what we expected happened. Understand, Tim Zhu is a sniper. He is a much more accurate puncher than Sebastian Fundora. But Fundora's game is volume. Right? The argument raised here was simply that in a fight in the United States... If it went the distance, Zhu was going to be in trouble, just like Erickson Lubin ended up being in trouble in his fight, because technicians cannot match Sebastian Fundora in volume. So understand, Fundora over 12 rounds, and let's just do the math quickly here. Over 12 rounds, he threw... 321 more punches, according to CompuBox, than Tim Zhu. 321 more punches. Now understand, he only lands 19 more punches than Tim Zhu in the fight. But the visual is damning. While Tim Zhu is waiting for opportunities, Fundora, who can be a lead puncher, is creating the opportunities Fundora also is much taller than Tim Zhu. So, of course, the visual is a bad visual. It's the taller man throwing a lot more volume on the shorter man. Fundora takes the title. More importantly, you take the casino. In a fight in which this late replacement was mispriced as a greater than 3-1 to one underdog. Right? Congratulations. More beer for us. Let's talk about the next fight. And this one was fascinating. Gilberto Ramirez versus Arsene Gulamarian. What I want people to do is to go to the pre-fight video and read the comments. There was a lot of resistance to the idea of Gilberto Ramirez uh, being the pick here. Right? Now, understand, the bet I propose... The extra base part of the bet was the under 10 and a half rounds. You were getting that at greater than a plus 200. The walk away hedge and the way I structured my own personal bet was, you know, the walk away hedge was Gilberto Ramirez by decision. Right? The hedge held. I did not make a profit on this fight or I made a very small profit on the fight. Right? Gilberto Ramirez, by decision, at the time I placed the bet, as I said in the video, was a minus 103 at the time I made the video. Right? So you got pretty much even money on Gilberto Ramirez by decision. Our real play was on the under 10.5 rounds, which I thought was mispriced at a plus 200. Understand, you did not get the extra base part of the play. But because Gilberto Ramirez delivered by winning by decision, you won that part of the bet. You get to walk away without a loss. You get to live for another day, right? But what I want people to do, there was a misperception here based in part on how the guys look. Gula Marian, 
of course, has a six-pack, has no fat around his midsection. Gulamarian has the bigger neck than Gilberto Ramirez. At the weigh-in, it looked like Gulamarian was the bigger man, the more muscular man at a minimum. Right, so many people in the comment section said, hey, you got to be kidding here, Dwyer. Given the history, given that Gilberto Ramirez was coming up from 168, given that his prior fight at cruiserweight was against really another light heavyweight who was coming up to cruiser, Joe Smith, right? Given Ramirez's lack of experience at cruiserweight and given the fact that he was fighting the bigger man, the idea was that the bigger man was going to impose himself on Gilberto Ramirez and knock Gilberto Ramirez out. Now, what I want people to do, and I mentioned this in the pre-fight video, and that's a public video. That's online. Anyone can check that video. Gilberto Ramirez is one of the sport's premier body punchers. Right? I was raised in the Larry Holmes era where Larry Holmes always had body fat. He didn't look like Ken Norton, right? Guys back then had body fat. Look at Buster Douglas's body, for crying out loud, right? Folks, the way a fighter looks, at least to me, doesn't convey the fighter's skill level, right? Skill-wise, Gilberto Ramirez is one of the premier body punchers in boxing. Now that the fight has happened, without even giving the numbers, what I want people to do is to go to the CompuBox number. Now here he is fighting a tough guy who wanted to be in the pocket. Okay, okay. Gilberto Ramirez was his huckleberry. Gulamarian is in the pocket trying to rough up Ramirez, who surprisingly is in the pocket himself. Here's the difference between the two fighters as reflected in the CompuBox numbers, right? Look at the body shots. More importantly, CompuBox breaks out the body shots. You see jabs to the body. Then they have another category, power punches to the body. Now understand, I don't care how the brother looks. Gilberto Ramirez in this fight against this tough guy who supposedly is bigger who's more muscular, who looked more in shape. Gilberto Ramirez dominates the power body shots. Right? Understand, many of these fights are a bit of an illusion. You can hit some of these boxers with a car, and they're going to try to look like they're not hurt. Right? Just to understand, Gilberto Ramirez takes away Gula Marian's body. Any judge looking at the body shots and the ferocity of the body shots, not just the volume, but the ferocity of the body shots, right? The power in the body shots would say, wow, Gilberto Ramirez is landing the harder punches in this fight. So if your fetish in boxing is who's the tough guy in the fight, and if you're trying to equate that to who looks tough at the weigh-in, let me suggest an alternative view. It's who's landing with regularity the power body shots in the fight. Let me point out, too, Ramirez's only loss was to Dimitri Bevel in that fight. Ramirez, and he lost the fight. Right? Bevel is a combination puncher. Bevel control the movement in the fight. But just understand, Bevel takes him out the pocket in the fight. But just understand, in that fight, Gilberto Ramirez dominates the power body shot stat. Right? The most revealing thing in the telecast, by the way, of this Gula Marian Gilberto Ramirez fight was the post fight interview where they're talking to Ramirez and they ask him about fighting at 200. After all, he was the champ at 168. And Ramirez makes a confession. It's on film. You now have it. 
where he admitted during the interview what we've always known. He walks around at 210 pounds. Let me repeat that. This guy walks around at 210 pounds. Now I'll concede. He's not a quick twitch Roy Jones level athlete. I'll concede that. But this is the part of the sport where you're dealing with the technician. Right? Understand, against Joe Smith, his prior fight, he's moving outside the pocket and he's showing you an excellent jab. This fight, he's in the pocket against a so-called tough guy. He's keeping his head low and he's going to the guy's body. Right, folks, you don't have to be an elite athlete to have elite skills. Keep an eye on Gilberto Ramirez. He's underrated. You can tell that just by reading the comments to the pre-fight video. Let's talk about another fight call here. This was a February 3rd, 2024 members only video about Raleigh Romero versus Isaac Cruz. The play I suggested was Isaac Cruz. He was the favorite at a minus 195 simply to win with some, as I put it in the video, sprinkled on Cruz by stoppage. Folks, this is clear profit across the board. Right? Cruz not only wins the fight, he wins it by stoppage. Let me just point out that Cruz's body shots in an earlier fight hurt the former Gervonta Davis, who now goes by Abdul Wahid. Just to understand here, Cruz, who's short to begin with, knows how to leverage his height because he can get even lower. He's wicked to the body, and he has the leverage and angles figured out where he can come up top with big shots. So while his head is low, while he's hard to find, he's finding you with a withering body attack and power shots up top. That was too much for Raleigh Romero. Um, at times, too, Raleigh tried to move away from Cruz. Just understand, though, the problem is while Raleigh can move, Raleigh can't throw punches on the move. In other words, you see Raleigh moving, you understand he has to go flat-footed before throwing power shots. Right? That's very different than, let's say, an Ali or a Tyson Fury who are moving and you say, okay, great, let me try to corner the guy. And while you're walking in, you're getting hit with shots. Right? Think the Sonny Liston rematch for Ali. Um, just think about Tyson Fury when he's on the move and people try to crowd him, right? That's not Raleigh. So Raleigh's moving away from Cruz, but then Raleigh would stop. And of course, Cruz would find him. <laughs> Cruz is on his front foot hunting the guy, realizing that Raleigh didn't have the accuracy to throw accurate low power shots when Cruz was ducking. Now, to the powers that be in boxing, I think a fascinating fight. Apart from, of course, a Cruz, former Gravante Davis rematch, would be Cruz against Ishmael Barrazo. Folks, that's a great fight. I thought Barrazo was beating Raleigh Romero when they fought. And, of course, the referee messed up that fight, right, in my opinion. Of course, Barrazzo then, you know, is given a contender status by the sanctioning body who knew that Raleigh Romero, that Raleigh Romero stoppage was a little bit bogus. And of course, he delivered uh, against uh, Davies with an early stoppage, right? Just to understand, Barrazzo, like Cruz, is a power puncher. He is a closer. That fight would be fascinating. Let's hope the powers that be consider Cruz against Ishmael Barrazzo. Finally, on March the 15th, 2024, I made another members-only video 
Um, Erislandi Lara against Michael Zarafa. Now, the bet I proposed was Lara as a minus 321 favorite, simply to win, hedged with the over. So this fight really was a break-even. Lara delivers the win, but but it wasn't an over. Zarafa could not make it out of the second round. Right? So that fight is, in essence, a wash. What I want the Zarafa people, Menino Denaire, Bay Area. Let me give a plug to Denaire. What I want the uh, Zarafa people to consider is, how could you fight a guy in America whose nickname is the American Dream and then decide to be as low volume as Zarafa was? Folks, understand, Lara is 40 years old. Right? You need to make him feel old. You understand some of his toughest fights, the Jared Hurd fight, the Brian Castano fight, were opponents who pushed him. The last thing you want is a slow-paced, low-volume fight against this level of technician. Right? Understand, Laura's a southpaw. Understand, Laura's straight left is one of the best punches in boxing, right? Against this type of technician, and I understand it takes a couple of rounds to figure out the angles, but Lara is at his best when an opponent fights the kind of fight that Zarafa fought here, right? You need more feints. You need to, as you figure out the lay of the land, you need to stay away from the old man straight left, don't you? Right? What I didn't like with the stoppage is where Zarafa is. <laughs> First, Zarafa is there in line for the straight left. That's a mistake. That's like fighting Deontay Wilder and being in line for his straight right. Right? Then, of course, Zarafa doesn't have anywhere to go. He's over by the ropes. Player, it's the second round. You've got to be kidding me. So I thought Zarafa fought the wrong fight. I do feel Zarafa is underrated, but here he played into Lara's hands. Um, I don't care what the age is, particularly for Lara. Since Lara is so inactive, right? PBC needs to look at itself and ask why its fighters are so inactive. I understand their TV deals that had to be negotiated. This is their first time on Amazon. I get it. But just to understand that Lara, because he's inactive, doesn't have the wear and tear on his body at 40 years old that other people would have at middleweight at 40 years old. Right? Understand, too, He's a technician, so you really have to treat him like Sebastian Fundora treated Tim Zhu, right? By the way, to the powers that be in boxing, a great fight, and I mean a great fight, would be Sebastian Fundora, now the champ at 154, against Arislandi Lara at 160, right? Just understand... This is another fight where there's a possibility that a highly technical champion, in this case Lara, could be overwhelmed by Fundora's volume. Let me also say, too, that if Fundora is concerned that if he gains the weight to 160, he won't be able to pivot back down to 154 where there are some big fights, right? Errol Spence now wants to fight at 154, conceivably Terrence Crawford would be an opponent at 154, right? Let me just say, Crawford wants to fight Canelo. Crawford could come up to 160, right? Later, Fundora doesn't have to come up to 160 to fight Arislandi Lara. That's not as important as is avoiding Lara's straight left. Right, so think it through. Lara, who is lower volume, 
would be taken out of his comfort zone by someone capable of throwing more than 320 more punches against puncher Tim Zhu. Right? Food for thought. So to the powers that be, I'm just throwing out a couple of speculative fights. Right? Isaac Cruz against Ishmael Barrazo. Oh, that's a great fight. High volume, Sebastian Fundora, the champ at 154 against one of the champs at 160. Erislandi Lara, that's a great fight. Let me also say too, and it has to be said because I want the fight fans here to see the full lay of the land. 160 has a dominant champ. Janabek. He's one of the most avoided fighters in the game. Let's just say, while I don't know who would win, Fundora against Arislandi Lara, I take Janabek at 160 over Sebastian Fundora. Right? Just food for thought. Understand, too, that Lara, Southpaw, Janabek, Southpaw. Right? Let's think it through. In fact, let's spread it out. Right? Um... Well, I'll just leave it there for now. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.